As I said last week, we kind of wrapped up Genesis. We'll be beginning our Advent message series for four Sundays in a row. And we, what we want to do is kind of a beautiful takeoff from Genesis. Imagine Genesis is kind of our, our long runway we've been on for a while here. But now the plane is taking off to point us to the glories of Christ, even in, during the time of Christmas, during the time of Advent. And as we look at Genesis 49, already another prediction of the Christ who is to come there. And we're going to pick up on that theme in the, New T- in the Old Testament, the rest of the Old Testament, and the New Testament as well throughout this series, King of Heaven, how all of Scripture points us to the glory of Christ. You know, when you look around the world today, you might think, what is the hope that we have in these dark times? You know, when this ridiculous world seems to be falling apart on a number of different fronts, maybe you would think the same of your own life at times this last week or this next week. You know, actually, holidays can be a very, a very stressful time for many people in many different ways. And you might ask, is there a king who can lead us in righteousness, who will not pervert justice? Is there anyone who can take the burdens and diseases of mankind and lift our eyes to hope once again? Yes, there is, actually. At a time in America and in the world where people don't even know the right questions to ask anymore. People don't even know the right questions to ask. Not only do we know the questions to ask, but we have the answers as the church of Christ. We know that there is one answer, and that is Christ, our King and Savior. Christ, our King and Savior. He's not just our future hope. I want you to make this clear. He's not just our future hope. No, He's the hope for today. Amen? We need that every single day. You need that today. You need that on Monday morning when you wake up. Okay? Right? (laughs) When you're driving to work, when you're picking so-and-so up, when you have to interact with such-and-such, you need hope every single day. And guess what? I've got good news for you. That's what the gospel means, by the way. It means good news. I've got good news for you. Christ has hope for you, not only every single day, but every single hour of every single day. He is the answer to the question of this broken world. And that's the gospel, that with his sword of justice, he will punish all iniquity, and he will forgive and redeem all that cast themselves upon him in repentance and faith. Do you notice both sides of the equation there? And I want you to to make sure you understand both of those things. Christ is our king, and he is our savior. In fact, he could not be your savior if he was not a mighty king who had defeated the powers of death, hell, and Satan. In fact, he would not be your king if he wasn't your savior (laughs) because then you would still be in rebellion against him. You would not have even had the chance to be reconciled to this king. You understand that? When Peter's preaching to the people, he says, know then for certain that God has made Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. He is both Lord and Christ, Messiah, Savior. You must have him as both or not at all. People will make that mistake at times. To the early Jews, they wanted a king. They understood that they needed a king. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, maybe this is our deliverer who will be the strong and mighty king we need to deliver us from the Romans, but they missed the fact that they needed forgiveness for their own sins. The greatest enemy was not Rome, but it was in fact their own iniquities, their hypocrisy, their idolatry, their lack of faith. They needed forgiveness. They got king, but they missed Savior. Today in America, we understand Savior, but we miss King. Both are an essential aspect to the gospel. But Christ is your Savior because he's your king. And that's what we want to focus on in this series, how all of Scripture points us to the kingship 
of Christ. Even Christmas is about worshiping the king of heaven who was born as a baby in the manger. And when you think about it in those terms, he's the king of heaven. He was the king of angel armies. When you first start with that thought, that's because that's where he was before he was incarnate, correct? When you start with that thought, which is where you should start, and then you go to the manger, it makes it that much more glorious and beautiful. That much more glorious and beautiful, that the king of heaven would leave that place, his throne, his palace. People appreciating and worshiping him constantly, which is his proper due. And come to a little stable, born into poverty in the middle of the night with no trumpets and no fanfare. (laughs) That makes the Christmas thought that much more glorious. And all of Scripture makes that very, very clear to us. The Messiah has already been predicted in Genesis. You remember all the way back, what we call the Proto-Euangelion, the first gospel back in Genesis where it said that the seed of the woman will crush the seed of the serpent and the head of the serpent. And that was, a, that was a proclamation in advance of the victory of Christ over the devil and those who are of him. So already you had that, but also in Genesis 49, in Jacob's blessing upon his son Judah. Judah sort of had a, a mixed past so far, hasn't he? We've had a number of sermons kind of talking about Judah. But it's very interesting because kingship is going to come through Judah's line. And there's a prophecy that's going to go all the way forward through David to Christ that you find here in chapter 49. Let's see it very explicitly here. Let's read verses 8 through 12. Jacob pronounced this blessing on his son Judah. Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your father's sons shall bow down before you. Judah's a lion's cub from the prey, my son, you have gone up. He stooped down, he crouched as a lion, and as a lioness, who dares rouse him? The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, until tribute comes to him, and to him shall be the obedience of the peoples, binding his foal to the vine, and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He has washed his garments in wine, and his vesture in the blood of grapes. His eyes are darker than wine, and his teeth whiter than milk. What is being prophesied or promised here? There's some odd features that come through in this prophecy. You're kind of wondering, let's put some of these things together. Let's kind of go through what is actually being promised or prophesied. Then we'll talk about the way it's fulfilled as well. First of all, preeminence among the tribes, which is very interesting because this is formally kind of what was being said about Joseph. Um, which would come true in a number of ways. But also later he says that Judah is going to actually have preeminence among the tribes. When when the people of Israel come out of the Exodus, out of Egypt, you see that Judah is actually a very large, in fact, one of the largest tribes. And you see that reflected in the size of the tribe, but ultimately you see that reflected in Christ's kingdom, the greatest kingdom ever to be on the face of the earth. His kingdom is forever. You look at every other kingdom or tribe or clan, for that matter, even even physical Israel, and they rise to prominence and they peter out. But what about Christ's kingdom? (laughs) You know, it's proper to say there are more Christians on the earth now than there ever have been, right? Actually, the population of the earth keeps growing, right, since, you know... Christ was walking the earth. You know, we're now almost 7 billion, what? But, in fact, there are so many Christians. Christ's kingdom has actually continued to grow and grow. And let me tell you something. It will continue to grow. Though persecuted and even stamped out of certain locations at times almost completely, it will continue to grow in his own way, in his own time, across the face of the earth. He will have preeminence, not just among the tribes of Israel, but among all the peoples of of the world. And victory over his enemies goes right with that. In verse 8, you see it there. Christ has and will defeat sin, death, 
and the devil. This is an essential part of what a, a ruler, a good king does, right? He's actually able to beat your enemies. That's one of the reasons he's your king, right? Who wants to serve a weak king? Who wants to serve a king that when the enemies come, he runs and hides in his castle while all of you peasants and villagers get wiped out, right? And he comes back out again. Is he going to be your king? Or are you going to leave for the next kingdom over where maybe the king will defeat the enemies, right? Christ is our king who will vic- be victorious over our enemies. And it's very interesting. In verse 9, it calls him a lion. It just kind of gives an analogy in general here of him being a lion who is a great hunter, mighty. Lion would, would come to stand for kingship, very much so as the analogy goes, and also for strength, and even calls him ferocious. Um, this is a picture also of Christ's kingship, that he is called the Lion of Judah in Revelation 5. Only one, it's kind of a cryptic reference, only one other time is he called the Lion of Judah, and it happens all the way at the end, is Genesis Prediction of Christ as the lion who's going to come from Judah. Now, in Revelation 5, it says that he is the lion of Judah. Even though it also says simultaneously he's the lamb. See, lion and lamb, king and savior, right? The lamb who was slain. The picture in Revelation 5 is that it's a lamb who was slain for our sins. And yet it calls that lamb who was slain for our sins the lion of Judah, the ferocious, victorious, conquering king, right? Christ is the Lion of Judah. It says that very explicitly in Revelation as well. Then it says he will have the kingly scepter, right? The ruler's staff will not depart from his feet. The scepter will be there until tribute comes to him. And it says the obedience of the peoples. This is not just the obedience of the other tribes of Israel. The obedience of the peoples of the world. Again, what other kingdom? Can you name one that claimed sovereignty over all the peoples of the earth and actually maintained that? Actually continued to grow over the last 2,000 years? 4,000 years? No, only Christ's kingdom is a permanent kingdom. When you get involved at times in your life in a club, have you ever joined a club before? Or an organization Maybe a worthy organization even. Um, maybe you're part of a very upstanding business or company that's been there for 100 years. It seems like they're going to be there for another 100 years. But no matter how great the institutions of man come and then go, none will ever compare to the only institution on earth that is forever. And that is God's kingdom, his church the only institution on earth that is for eternity, God's kingdom and his church. He will be our king. It's talking about that very explicitly. Now from Judah is going to come King David, right? The true king and shepherd of Israel. And we're going to talk about that next week. Okay, there's kind of a middle piece to this fulfillment. And David says that his throne is going to be forever. It's promised to David this, this whole prophecy is going to get built up a lot more during the time of David. Immediately before David, during David, and even after David, the prophets will reflect back to David and says, David's throne is going to be forever. And they're talking about, they're building it up to Christ, the Messiah, that much more. But it's important to understand that Christ is the king predicted here. From Judah, yes, from Judah will come the kingly line. Jesus is in that lineage from Joseph of Judah. That's what tribe Jesus would have been born into. It's important for us to understand that as well. Next, a little complicated. It says, binding his foal to the vine, his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He's washed his garments in wine and his vesture in the blood of grapes. I take this to be an agricultural uh, wonderland. You know, even the vines are almost like trees. You know, if there's a little vine, you can't tie a donkey to that, right? If there's a huge vine, have you ever seen a huge vine at one, maybe maybe a, a, a vineyard that's been there for many, many years? Those trunks can be that thick, actually, of a vine. You can tie a donkey to it very easily. 
And then there's wine and grape harvests everywhere. So prosperity under this king. But it's also very interesting that it mentions him being on a donkey, not a horse. Wouldn't you think that a, a great and mighty king, like, like the picture in Revelation, he comes on a, on a white steed, right? A great war horse is seemingly the proper analogy for a king. And yet it says he's going to come on a donkey. Can you think of a king who came on a donkey? <laughs> Christ did, of course. It was a sign in Judaism of, of, of a humble king. Maybe from humble origins, something like that, was the picture of a donkey that they would have had. This king would actually ride on a donkey. And yet did not Christ ultimately fulfill that. He was the humblest king that you will ever know. He was. He came from poverty when he was born on this earth. And when he came into Jerusalem, he had a borrowed donkey. Not a single war horse that he could claim for his own at the time, but on a borrowed donkey, he came into Jerusalem. Right. One day, yes, he will come again on a white horse, which is his proper due. But in the meantime, he's not only our king who, under his reign, we will flourish even materially, you know, wine and the blood of grapes. He will prosper his people. And he has a great feast waiting for us in heaven, it says. Great things are ahead under his kingship, under his rule, my friend. If Christ is your king, you simply cannot go wrong. Things are only going to get better and better. Jesus said when he was having the last supper with his disciples, he says, I will not even drink this cup again until I come into my kingdom. Until you're there with me in heaven, then we'll all drink together. You drink it in the meantime to remember and to experience my presence, but we'll drink it together in heaven once again. Even the the picture there is very beautiful. Prosperity and the wine as well. His eyes are darker than wine and his teeth whiter than milk. This would have been a, a good thing. This would have been a healthy person, right? Their eyes are bright in that sense of uh, they have this color to them, this, this dark red color to them. His teeth whiter than milk. Health, good health, white teeth symbolized. Death could not hold Christ down. It's not just good health that's fulfilled in King Jesus, but actual resurrection and eternal life forever as well. Yes, under his kingship, not only would we have prosperity, but also health. In fact, Jesus upped the ante even more. (laughs) Not just that he would give us resurrection, but in fact, eternal life is what's promised in Christ. Eternal life. These tents are fading away, aren't they? You have times where you have not prosperity in this world before you have to understand that this life is like a the kingdom of god and the the kingdom of the prince of this air going back and forth even in your heart even in your life let alone in your body and your mind at times there's this tussle back and forth between these things right as our paul says our bodies are wasting away but inwardly we're being renewed to glory more and more right there's this already not yet aspect to the kingdom of God where it's like these things are true but not yet but mostly but coming the sense of development that you find when the, when we talk about the kingdom of God in this earth right and you have to have Christ as your king in order to even benefit from those things you know it's very interesting as Americans right we don't we don't necessarily like the idea of a king even ever since the time of the revolution when we Right, But in fact, if you actually had a king, what's the reason we don't want a king? Because most of the time they're corrupt and they're bad and then they're just going to do whatever they want to do and we have to serve them, right? But what if you actually had a king who was perfectly righteous, perfectly just, and was always good, even merciful? Would that not be a king that you would want to serve? It's very interesting because, again, we celebrate the Lamb, but the early Christians, for example, the Christians who met in the catacombs of Rome, (laughs) that's not a real nice church building, just so you know. 
The Christians who met in the catacombs underneath the streets of Rome, the graves. You know, talk about a scary place to take your kids for Sunday school, right? What kind of, they had certain catacombs where they would meet every, every Sunday, sometimes every day. And what kind of artwork did they have on the walls of the catacombs? The most common artwork found on the catacombs underneath the streets of Rome is that of Christ as a judge sitting on his throne with the world under his feet judging the world. Wow. They were worshiping Christ as judge. How could they? You know, that's, you know, wow. They're being persecuted every single week of their lives. They understand the need for a king who will deliver them from the present evil world. Maybe you're too good friends with the world to not want to see Christ judge it. Maybe you're in love with the world. As John says, we cannot be. You don't want to see it judged or all these things go away that you enjoy. Christ's kingdom is coming. Be sure of that. But there's some questions to apply this to your life that you need to to ask and to answer this morning about this Christ who was king and was born in the manger, who rose again from the dead and ascended back into heaven and is coming one day again as king of all the earth. First of all, which side of Christ are you on? Justice or grace? Justice or grace? Jesus said when he was walking on this earth, if anyone's not for us, they're against us. Christ is the rock that you're broken over one way or the other. Either the rock will crush you or you're crushed upon that rock. You're broken. Your heart is broken. Either you're against Christ and you're still under his judgment or he is your king and your savior willingly and he, he will give you nothing but grace in the end. Are you for him or against him? Second, are you trusting that as the king of heaven the king of justice, the king of angel armies, that he will come one day to set all things right. Maybe you've experienced injustices in your life. Maybe you see those at times around you. He will set all things right. You know what? Therefore, you don't have to. You don't have to take an eye for an eye. It was very interesting once because I remember talking to an Egyptian man And this Egyptian man from Egypt, his first generation here in America, and he said, since coming to America, I've learned that the way we're doing things in the Middle East, an eye for an eye is never going to work. An eye for an eye is never going to work because it's just the same cycle of violence over and over and over again. That's right. You don't have to take an eye for an eye. Well, I took an eye. I need to take an eye. No. Christ himself will be the judge on his throne in the day of judgment he will repay all things therefore you don't have to you can release it you can let it go trusting that he is your king and he will do what is needed to be done right furthermore let's work together here on this earth let's not just talk about heaven let's talk about here on this earth to advance his kingdom do you know that his kingdom is coming to this earth It's not just you go to his kingdom when you die. (laughs) Yes, you'll be there in its fullness. But his kingdom is advancing here on earth until heaven and earth are one. It says when he remakes the new heavens and the new earth, it's all going to be united together. He is remaking and advancing his kingdom on this earth more and more. Let's do the work of the kingdom together, right? Let us help the poor and the hurting, the foreigner and the widow and the orphan. Let us evangelize the lost who have no hope. Let's grow in our knowledge and application of the word of God, which is the plan of the king, every single day of our lives, right? And this Christmas season, let's worship with all of our might. Let's bow before his manger, just like those first wise men did who were sages of the east. They brought all their treasure, their gold, their myrrh, wonderful smelling things. They laid it before the King Jesus. They bowed before his manger. Just like that, let's bow and worship the King who was born in a manger this Christmas season because that's what it's all 
about. Worshiping Jesus. Knowing that the king of the universe came for you and he came for all. Let's worship Christ, the infant king, even this Advent season. Amen.